Good morning. It's good to see you. You're all looking well wrapped up. We're going to have some colder weather coming. So that's going to be a challenge. And some of you that are from other countries, like African countries, we may get some real snow. So you might experience snow for the first time if you've never experienced it. That's what they're promising. Anyway, doesn't 2023 seem a long way away? We're now in 2024, and I want to speak this morning about faith for 2024. What do you believe in God for? What are you expecting? What are you hoping for in this year that we have begun? The Bible says that... Um, doesn't say that. Let me just get to the right page, wherever we were. I'll find it... Um, Okay, let, let's just start all over again. Right, that's better. Okay. The Bible says faith is being sure of what we hope for. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. So what are you hoping for in 2024? Peter said the other night in our week of prayer, I think it was more for 24. I think that's... Uh, it's quite a nice few little uh, catchphrases we can link in with 2024. But what are you hoping for in 2024? Are you facing the year with optimism or pessimism? I wonder what you're anticipating. Because depending on your mindset, 2024 could be a delightful year or it could be a disastrous year. It all depends on how we think, what our outlook and expectation is. Um, Winston Churchill, that great former Prime Minister of here in the UK, he once said that a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. I wonder which you are. Or George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright, he said this, both optimists and pessimists contribute to society. The opt optimist invents an aeroplane. The pessimist invents the parachute. Harry Truman, former president of the United States, he said, a pessimist is one who makes difficulties of opportunities, and an optimist is one who makes opportunities out of difficulties. And one other, Eleanor Roosevelt, she was the wife of Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States, going back a long time. She said, a stumbling block to the pessimist is a stepping stone to the optimist. So what are you today? Are you a glass half full person or a glass half empty? What is your outlook on life? What are you expecting and believing in God for, for 2024? The Bible tells us in the book of Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. Those who put their trust in God have to live by faith irrespective of what the future may be or what it might be looking like. We live in a hopeless time. You only have to read the news. You only have to switch on uh, the social media feeds. And you know there's a lot of bad stuff going on in our world today. Lots of things are kicking off and it's not looking very helpful the future doesn't look bright. Tomorrow is uncertain. The cost of living is constantly going up. However, the Bible teaches us that the future is always good with God. Why? Because the future is in his hand and he is sovereign. And I want to take you to the Old Testament, to the book of Ezekiel. And I want to turn you to Ezekiel 37. You know that my style of preaching and teaching is very systematic. I like to get into the Word and see what something teaches us out of the Scriptures. So we're going to go to Ezekiel 37, and I want to read the first 14 verses. It might be very familiar to some of you. To others of you, it might be new. But it's an amazing passage in the Bible from an Old Testament prophet who God raised up at a very significant time. And let's read it together. So Ezekiel 37 1 to 14. Ezekiel says, The Lord took hold of me and he carried me away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with dry bones. He led me all around the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, 
Can these bones become living people again? Ezekiel said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know the answer to that question. Then the Lord said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says, look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message, just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bones, but they still had no breath in them. Then the Lord said, Speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath came into these bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy them to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you. You will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. What a great passage from the Bible. What a remarkable experience that this Old Testament prophet had when God showed him this valley of dry bones. But what does it say to us today? What can we learn from this experience? How can we have faith for 2024? You see, Ezekiel is given this to teach us about faith. Here is a valley that previously had a great army, and this army had fallen. The bones of these bodies have been picked clean by the wild animals and the vultures, and now they are parched white as they've been roasted in the sun. This army represents the state of the nation of Israel. Once it was a great nation, but now it's as good as dead because they turned their backs on God. They'd live lives in rebellion to the word of God, and as a consequence, they are now exiled into another land, which was called Babylon. But Ezekiel, whose name means God strengthens, he is sent with a message to give them hope, to give them a belief that they do have a future, that God has good plans for them, that they can have faith for their future. And so this message is incredibly powerful to every time and generation if we will receive what God wants to say to us. So look at it with me and see some things that we learn about faith. The first thing we learn about faith is that faith envisions, envisions us. Can you say that? Faith envisions us. Because God came to Ezekiel and said, Hey, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? God was wanting him to catch a vision concerning what he was seeing. If you don't have vision for life, then all you will ever see is death. Some people wake up in the morning and they look at the paper and they read the list of obituaries to see if their name is there. Because they've got no hope for the future. You will have little direction in life. You will have little purpose for living if you have no vision. The optimist sees possibility while the pessimist sees impossibility. Can these bones live again? 
It's a question about your outlook on life. That's why I say, what are you expecting in God for 2024? They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's how some people live their lives. No faith, no expectation, no belief that anything will ever be different. But our God is the God of change and transformation and he calls us to live by faith and to expect him to do the miraculous even in the face of the impossibility. Can these bones live? God was challenging Ezekiel to see if he had faith to believe for life in the place of death. Now, naturally speaking, that was ridiculous. How often do you go and visit a cemetery and think about the dead bodies coming to life? Do you ever think like that? Or you just think, well, these people are nice, they're all laying there, very quiet and very still, and they're resting in peace, as we often say. It's a ridiculous notion, isn't it? To expect that they will suddenly jump out of their graves. They're buried. They're dead. They're gone. They're history. And of course, we know that outside of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Can I ask you this morning, are there things in your life that seem to be dead and gone, but God is asking you to believe for them again? Is there stuff in your past that you've assigned to the past, believing that it's, it's dead, it's finished? But is God saying to you this year, can I bring it to life again? Prodigals. Children and people that once walked with the Lord and they've gone away and you've given up hope. Is God saying to you again, can they walk with me again? Can they return to my house again? Can you believe for me to do a miracle in their life again? Is God asking you that today? Have there been lost opportunities in your life? Somebody once said that an opportunity is like a bald man with a tuft of hair on the front. If you don't grab him when he's coming towards you, you'll never get hold of him when he's gone. Sometimes we miss opportunities. I'm not thinking of turning up at a sale and missing a bargain. But life-changing opportunities, sometimes we miss them. God is a God of redemption. And he wants to say to you today, I can make that opportunity live again if you've got faith. Maybe you live with broken dreams. Something you once hoped for. Something you once believed was going to happen. And something caused it to break. Is God saying to you, can you believe me again? to do that for you because I am the God who can restore broken dreams. You see, with God, the ridiculous can become possible if we have faith to believe. But also, when we have vision, of course, it involves risk. It's about God in calling us to have big faith for impossibilities to be made possible. John Wimber that great man who was the founder of the Vineyard Movement, he once said, faith is spelt R-I-S-K. You see, Ezekiel was a well-established prophet. He had a reputation. Here he was, staking his life, if he went to the people and said, you can live again. Oh no, not another prophet coming and telling us the impossible. No wonder he answers God when God says, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? No wonder he says, oh God, only you know the answer to that. Because he was frightened to take the risk to declare that something that's impossible can be made possible with God. Unless we're prepared to be a people who risk things for God, we will never be a people of faith. There was a great Baptist missionary who went to China in the 1800s. His name was Hudson Taylor. This is what he said. 
unless there is an element of risk in our exploits for God, there is no need for faith. You see, when you believe God for the impossible, you're taking a risk. You remember Peter and John, Sanjay, you mentioned it this morning, when they went up to the temple and that beggar was sitting there, he'd never walked in his life and he would beg as people went to worship. And they asked them for money and Peter and John said, sorry mate, we don't have any shekels to give you. But in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. They took a risk. They dared to believe that God could do the impossible in this man's life. And Peter took him by the hand and said, get up in the name of Jesus. And he stood up and he walked and he leaped and he jumped and he ran, praising God into the temple. They had never had a service in the temple like that one before. And it caused an uproar. God loves people who are willing to take risks. That's why Jesus loved Peter. Because when Jesus came to the disciples in the storm, walking on the water, they were terrified. And then Peter said, Jesus, if it's you, can I do that? And he gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. What did the other disciples do? They weren't prepared to take the risk. But Peter was. You see, when we put our faith in God, he envisions us. He envisions us to believe that the impossible can be made possible. What does God want to vision you with in your life for this year? What does God want you to see that at the moment looks impossible but by faith can be made possible because of the power of God? But we learn also in this passage that faith enlarges us. Because God says to Ezekiel, speak a prophetic message to the winds. I, earlier this week, had a CT scan. I laid on this bed in the hospital room, and then they slide you into this sort of big donut and they all go out and leave you, put a cannula in your arm because of a contrast dye, and then they set the thing going. And then this voice says, breathe in and hold your breath. So I'm laying there flat, and I breathe in, and I was aware of my chest expanding. Now, if you go for an MRI scan, that's a bit different, because I've had that, And the voice says, breathe out and hold it. I tell you, that's very different. Because when you empty your lungs and hold it, after a while, your brain is saying, you need to get some air back in your body again. And I'm there, lying there with nothing. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Breathe normally. (sighs) But the CT scan is brilliant because as you breathe in, it enlarges you. You know the definition of a lifeless body? It's one that's got no breath in it. You know, I've been to the birth of all four of our children. And I want to say Janice has been a hero four times at bringing our children into the world. And if you're a mum here today, then I want to say you are a hero at having brought your children into the world. And every father here needs to remember your wife Mother is a hero. Because I want to tell you guys, we could not do it. We could not. The problem is with men, they can't conceive a thing. Think about it. But every woman who goes through labor and brings birth is a hero. But you know what the most important and exciting moment is? It's when the baby cries. That first cry. Why is it so thrilling and exciting? Because you know breath has entered that newborn child and he or she is alive. Do you know whenever God breathes, something happens? At the beginning of creation, 
God said, let us make man in our image. If you want to know where we find the Trinity in the Bible, it's right there. Let us make man in our image. And he makes Adam. And this guy is standing there, this handsome, gorgeous, fabulous man standing there with muscles rippling, with six packs and all of that. Perfect guy. But he's lifeless. And the Bible says God breathes into him and becomes a living being. The psalmist Reflecting on creation, said this. The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. After the children of Israel had escaped from Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, Moses reflects on that moment, and he says, At the blast of your breath, the waters piled up. Job, in speaking eloquently about God, he said, if God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn to dust. Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, the Bible says he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. You see, whenever God breathes, something happens. I don't often get pictures, but I felt God impress something on me the other day you know what this beautiful flower is don't you most of us rip them up because they're weeds the dandelion but it's beautiful in its own way one of my problems is that they give us dandelion leaves now when you go to for a meal this rocket stuff you ever had it, it gets stuck in your throat it looks like dandelion leaves why can't we have proper lettuce but never mind but God created the dandelion. It's got a beauty. And once it's finished flowering, that's what it turns into. There comes a moment when the wind blows the seeds. You see, the church is something beautiful. Jesus loves us as his people. He looks at us and sees we are beautiful. But at Pentecost, God breathed. Why did he breathe? So that we might be empowered to spread the good news of the gospel. Read in Acts chapter 2, a mighty rushing wind came. And when those disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, the gospel spread with great power through the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants you to be. Like that dandelion that has the breath, the wind that blows on it and scatters the seeds so it will multiply itself so that you will have weed after weed in your garden. But the church is not a weed. It's a life-transforming group of people that God has placed upon the face of the earth. You see, when God breathes, something happens. And God says to Ezekiel, prophesy, come, O breath, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. And as Ezekiel prophesied, suddenly they stood up and they came to life. <coughs> when we speak prophetically, God enlarges us. You're a bigger man, you're a bigger woman when you prophetically declare the word of God. Remember that. Faith always makes you bigger. Because of David's faith, he was bigger than the giant Goliath. Because of Elijah's faith, he was bigger than the 400 prophets of Baal and he called fire down from heaven. Because of Esther's faith, she was bigger than the murderous plot of Haman and she saved her nation. Faith enlarges you. It makes you a bigger man, a bigger woman. And faith in God brings about miracles because it always pleases him. Isaiah, 
11 verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. So if you've got faith, you please God. And Isaiah spoke of Jerusalem when they were in a time of spiritual infertility. And you'll remember the words. He said, sing, O barren woman. You who have never given birth, break into loud song. Enlarge your house. Build an extension because soon you will be bursting at the seams. That was a message of faith to believe for the impossible to be made possible. So my question is, what does God want to enlarge in your life this year? How does God want you to grow? How does God want to breathe his spirit into you this year so that you become a greater man, a greater woman of God? Because if you're the same by the end of 2024 as you are at the beginning of 2024, then not a lot will have happened in terms of faith in your life. God wants to enlarge you. God wants to expand you. God wants to increase you. What does he want to breathe into you this year to make you a bigger woman, a bigger man? You can become a bigger woman, a bigger man if you dare to prophetically live out the word of God in your life. You see, Ezekiel rose to the challenge that was set before him. He starts to prophesy, come win, breathe into these dead bodies. He begins to do what God had challenged him to do. Maybe you need to start doing what you've been asking God to do. Sometimes God wants us to be the answers to our own prayers. Did you know that? Maybe you've been praying for a long, long time for something to change. Maybe God wants you to be the key to that change. There was a wonderful man who smuggled Bibles into communist countries when the churches in those countries were desperate for Bibles. His name was Brother Andrew. He was the founder of Open Doors, a great Christian ministry. And this is what he said, God may ask you to become part of the answer of your prayers. If that happens, rejoice. For then you will be participating in the greatest adventure imaginable. He found that to be true. He was concerned for these churches in communist lands who had no Bibles and in his little VW Volkswagen he smuggled thousands and thousands into these countries over many years. Has God got an adventure waiting for you? Is God wanting you to respond like Isaiah in chapter 6 of Isaiah's book where he says, God, here am I, send me. You see, Isaiah caught a vision. He says, in the year that the reigning king Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord. He was envisioned. And then he was enlarged because he heard the call of God upon his life. He said, God, I'm ready. I'll go wherever you send me. You can rely on me. And he becomes this fantastic prophet in the Old Testament. Okay, let's just bring this to a conclusion this morning. Because faith not only envisions us, it not only enlarges us, but of course, it empowers us. Because God said, I will put my spirit in you. Another Old Testament prophet said, it's not in your strength, it's not in your ability, it's not in your wisdom, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, Jesus said to the early Christians, after he, as he was about to go to heaven, he says, go to Jerusalem and wait. We're not very good at waiting, are we? Do you like waiting at traffic lights? Do you know when we're approaching a green light, Janice will say to me, quick, get through it before it changes. So I put my foot down, but I have to be careful. She doesn't like waiting. If we go to the supermarket, there's a long queue. She'll say, oh, go in that one. Or if we're crossing the toll bridge at Southampton, toll, go in that one. It's the shorter one. So again, the shorter one, then somebody gets stuck because they haven't got enough money. But sometimes we don't like waiting, we don't like queuing. But then a good old British person mustn't grumble. You see, the Bible says, wait on the Lord. 
we live in a hurry culture. We live in a rush culture. We're constantly being pushed, constantly being driven. But Jesus said to those early disciples, go and wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. They waited 10 days. It might have taken 10 weeks. It might have taken 10 months, but they just simply went and waited. And after 10 days, there was a mighty rushing wind and God breathed. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. Without the Holy Spirit, we are weak. But faith empowers us when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, at the time of Ezekiel, the nation of Israel were literally saying, we've become old, we're like dry bones, our hope is gone. We've got nothing to look forward to, our nation is finished. That's the pessimistic spirit speaking. But Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. doesn't matter how old you are. You know, we're never too old to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. We're never to be too old to be used by the Holy Spirit. We're never too old to see the impossible being made possible by the power of God. That's the wonderful thing about the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the dynamic difference that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives. So with you and the Holy Spirit, all things are possible in the plan and purpose of God. So, what level of faith do you have for 2024? Is it going to rise right at the outset? Are you going to be a person of faith and power this year? Because a person without faith is weak. Listen to what Hebrews 11 says. I love this. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came down. How much more do I need to say, says the writer in Hebrews. But he goes on. It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned into strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. If they could do it, you and I can. Because the same God who breathed into them is the same God who breathes into us by his spirit. Faith empowers us through the work and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So what do you believe in God for? in 2024. 50 years ago, I heard a great song, and I tried to find the song version of it to play it to you today, but I couldn't find it, but I found the words. I'm not going to sing it. But it's written by a great American guy, Don Moan. You would have heard of him, wrote some great songs. Simply says, God can do it again. It goes like this, time after time I hear people say to me, why don't we see miracles like they used to be? I still believe in miracles. God hears us when we pray because God was God back yesterday and God is God today. God can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been, yesterday and today and forever. He's always the same. There's no reason to doubt God can do it again. You ask God to meet your needs, so why not trust in him? God has done it all before. He'll do it all again. He's willing, much more willing than I could ever say, to perform a mighty miracle in your life today. Will you stand with me? God can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been, yesterday and forever. He's always the same. There's no reason to doubt God can do it again. What do you want God to do for you? What do you choose to put your faith in God in this year 
so that he will envision you afresh, so that he will enlarge you, so that he will empower you. Because Jesus said, if you've got faith the size of a mustard seed, then nothing will be impossible. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Maybe you're just in a place you're saying, I feel fragile. My faith is weak. I want to believe God for more, but there's so much against me. I want to tell you, you're not in it on your own. God is with you. And he will do again and again and again what he's promised. What he did in the word, he will do it for you. Because he's just the same. He hasn't changed. We're going to sing, but as we sing a song, if you want prayer this morning, I'd just love you to come to the front. If you're struggling as we've stepped into a new year and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what is before me. I've prayed so many prayers and they don't ever seem to get answered. Maybe you're just at a place where where you feel your faith is weak. That's okay. God wants to strengthen your faith and faith comes by hearing, believing and doing what the Bible says. If you step forward this morning, that's a step of faith. Simply to come and say, God, I need more of you. I need my faith enlarging. I want to be filled afresh with your Holy Spirit. I want to have big faith for 2024 because you're a big God. And I want all that you've got for me in this year. Step forward as we sing and love to take time to pray with you.